appreciate it very much. We've had a wonderful week. We've enjoyed uh, each time that we've been able to come, enjoyed visiting with the Lafferty's and the church here. I so much appreciate the invitation. It's so good to see so many uh, friendly and familiar faces out in the crowd tonight. And I trust that you've been praying for the service. Uh, and he was right about Mandy bailing me out. She's done that on more than one occasion. <laughs> Singing. <laughs> I have to narrow it down because she bailed me out so many times out of so many things. Uh, appreciate the good singing tonight. Appreciate everyone's participation in the service. Pray that uh, what we have tonight will just be an added blessing. Uh, we need revival. Right. We want revival. Uh, Brother Larry says uh, he's not sure that any of us have really seen it. Uh, that may be right. That may be right. And we pray that we can see it. And that starts with us. I did, I, I've had this grandiose idea of what revival is and what it should be, and, and i got to admit, most of the time, my ideas of what revival is is when y'all get right. <laughs> you know? right. But until revival starts with me, uh, I may just end up watching you all enjoy it. And, uh, Let's turn to the book of Haggai tonight, chapter 2. We'll begin with verse 10. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then had said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. And now I pray you consider... From this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were, when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the press fat for to draw out fifty thistles of the press, there were but twenty. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet you turn not to me, saith the Lord. Consider. Now from this day and upward. From the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, is yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not brought forth from this day? Will I bless you? And so the work on the temple had stopped and people had gone home. But they didn't just take a weekend off. The, the temple foundation actually just laid there. And it sat and it sat and it sat. And while no progress was being made on the Lord's house, it looked like folks had plenty of time to work on their own houses. Things weren't going very well. And it seemed like no one understood why. It seemed like nobody could put the pieces together. And thus Haggai comes with this message from the Lord, and it's a simple word, it's this, it's considered. In two chapters, we have five different occasions where the Lord uses the word consider. Right. You've got to think about it. There must be a time of reflection. There must be a time of examination, of thought, where we consider and we take a look. So the Lord sends the prophet here, and in verse 12 and 13, he sends the prophet to ask the priests a couple of questions. These questions were not asked to test their knowledge. They were asked to test their discernment. Mm -hmm. We want revival, but to have it, we're going to need something more than we have right now. You're right. The challenge that was presented to Israel is our focus again tonight, our message, something more. Something more. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful to come again tonight, and for the many folks that are here, we're thankful for them. There's one person for sure we ask them to be in our midst, and that's uh, the Holy Spirit. We don't want you just to be here, but more we want you to, to move, and we want you to work on us and, and draw us close and help us to see, Lord, what it would be 
uh, what it would truly mean to be revived. Uh, we feel, just, just in ourselves and in our churches, we, we know there's a deadness. And, it, and it's not in our soul. We know that our soul's alive. We're born again. We're on our way to heaven. But Lord, there's just something that's dead about us. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we, we've got to get some things uh, back to where they need to be. There's some things maybe we need to get right. There's some things that we might need to get more serious about. There's some things maybe we haven't been doing that we need to do. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see tonight. Um, we need something more. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us to follow on and pursue you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Something more. Number one, questions answered. Questions answered. Haggai comes to the priest and he asks him a couple of questions. Look at verse 12. If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then said Haggai, if, if, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Now they got the answer right on both questions. But the passage reveals that while they knew the answers to questions, they had no real discernment. You think about these questions. Here's the, here's the illustration. He goes and you're supposed to ask the priest. So you, you imagine that a priest who's got on his, um, his holy garments and he's carrying something in the skirt of that garment. And as he's carrying it, he brushes up against something in the tabernacle or in the temple or wherever it may have been. Now, if he's carrying something off of the altar that's been sanctified and it's been blessed and he's carrying it in the skirt of his garment and he brushes up next to something, does what he brushed up against become holy then? The priest said, no. No, that doesn't work that way. They're right. <laughs> then he asked this question, but what if a priest, what if someone was unclean by touching a dead body and then they brush up against something, does it then become unclean? And the priests say, yes, it does work that way. It does become unclean. You see, they knew the answers to the questions. Clean doesn't make unclean clean, but unclean makes clean unclean. Right. Right. Simple enough? <laughs> clean doesn't make unclean clean. Unclean can make clean unclean. You're right. They knew the answer. They knew the answer to the question. Now, obviously, things were a mess, but nobody could seem to put it together. No one seemed to understand why. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. You sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, and you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2, verse 16. Since those days where when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. And when one came to draw out 50 vessels, there was only 20. Things are, things are messed up and been messed up for quite a while now. And now nobody seems to understand why. It just got, it's just kind of grown accustomed to the fact just got used to the fact that this is kind of the way things are. Um, things, have been, things have been bad for a while. Things don't go as far as they used to. Life isn't the way that it used to be. Things were fairly rotten. Why aren't things going right? And here's what the Lord sends the prophet with. He sends him with this question, or two questions to try and get them to grasp it. Can you touch something that's clean and make it, or can you touch something and make it clean? No. Can you touch something and make it unclean? Yes. Think about it. That's what the word consider means. They didn't get it. What's the, okay, you're saying that things aren't going right. What's the quickest way to make something unclean? You have someone that's unclean, touch it. You have a priest that's unclean, lay his hands on it. Put it together. Now, in this story, it's painfully and obviously clear. Now, they didn't see it. We can see it in hindsight. They quit building. They got away from God's work and God's house, and things went down. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't even see it when the prophet came and asked them a question about how, can, how do things become unclean? Things are a mess. Well, how do things become a mess? They couldn't put it together. They never could grasp the analogy. They could never understand the intent of the question. Sure, they knew the answer, but they didn't have any discernment to really understand what the prophet was talking about there. 
And you agonize them. Do you ever agonize when you're talking to someone and you're trying and trying and they don't they just don't see it? They don't see what you're talking about. Right. You might ask them a question and they even know the answer to the question, but don't have the discernment to see why you ask it in the first place. Right. And that's what's going on here with the children of Israel. As they come back from their captivity, they laid the foundation of the temple, they gave up, they quit working, they got away. Things are a mess now. And they never could figure out why. Number two, questions avoided. Questions avoided. So why can't they get it? If we can look at it, if we can look at the questions, and we can look at the surroundings, and we can look at it, we can put it together. We know what the prophet's saying. Why couldn't they get it? Probably for some of the same reasons that we don't get it about us. Right. Amen. We look around us, and we, listen, tonight... We all know the answers to the questions. Mm -hmm. okay. We know all the doctrines. We know how to spell them out. We know why we do what we do. We know all. We know why we're Baptists. We know all the answers to the questions. But half the time, we don't have any discernment. We don't. We don't have the sense and discernment to know what's going on in our world, what our role is in it, what we ought to be doing, how we ought to be faithful. We know. We know all the questions. We can answer anyone's questions. And yet still we look at it and see things are a mess. My life's a mess. I'm not nearly where I ought to be. I'm not as faithful nearly as I ought to be. I'm not the man of God that I should be. So why can't they, why can't we seem to get it? I'll give you a few thoughts here is that. I think one reason they, they didn't seem to get it is because they had very good intentions. I mean, they, they started the foundations of the temple, right? They, and I think that if you would have asked anyone, my guess would be that they would have said, well, yeah, we're going to finish it. Of course we're going to finish it. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to wait forever. Of course we're going to get back. We're going to get involved. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. My assumption is that they at least had decent intentions to go back eventually and finish. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll begin with verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, Amen. that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before... Not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. That is, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which he had. You know that thing Paul said you committed last year to do it? You remember you were forward a year ago. A year ago, you said, you know what, we're going to do this. We're going to take up this offering for this church. We're going to do this. We're going to be a blessing. We're going to get involved in this work. We're going to be active here. You remember that? That was a year ago. Right. And he says, I'm saying this, and my advice is that you prove the sincerity of your love. You know, after a while, us just saying things, it kind of don't matter. Mm -hmm. Saying yeah. things, saying, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we need. Here's where we got to act. Here's where we got to do this. After a while, good intentions kind of just seem to be just that. Right. Paul said, you promised to do this a year ago. I'm telling you to, to finish it, to do what you said you were going to do. You know, I, I'm guilty, right? Procrastination is my sin. It brings me not but sorrow. I know I should stop it. In fact, I will. Tomorrow. That's exactly how I am. I have the best intentions in the world, right? What is it they say? Good intentions are like curls on a pig's tail. It don't make any more ham. There's, not, there, there's no substance there in that. It's in the performance of it. He says, prove the sincerity. Prove, prove it's real. Right. Prove that it's real. Don't just talk about it. You know, oh, well, well we laid the foundation. Obviously, we're going to get back to it. I assume <laughs> that would have been the answer of any of those Israelites there. Of course, we're going to finish it. Really? When? Right. When? There it sits. There it lays. Nothing's happening. Nothing's doing. Oh, well, when we get time, when we get the money, when we get the ability, then, then we're, we're going to get back to it. Paul could look at the church in Corinth and say, it's been a year, guys. It's been a year. You look at the Judges chapter 9. 
Judges chapter 9, there's a story here of a man named Abimelech who had kind of usurped authority over the people of Shechem. Abimelech was an evil man. And there was a man named Gaal that had come in later in the story and he kind of got some loyalty from some of the men of Shechem. And in Judges chapter number 9 and verse 26, it says, Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. And they went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, Who's Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not, is not he the son of Jerubal and Zabel his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve them? And would to God this people were under my hand. Then would I remove Abimelech. Let me tell you what I do with Abimelech. Mm-hmm. Tell you what, I'd get rid of that guy. Right. I'd take care of business. I would get rid of Abimelech so fast. If I just had the opportunity, if I just had the chance, I'd get rid of this fella. Well, somebody slipped out and got word to Abimelech about what Gal had said. And if you look there in verse number 37, Gal spake again and said, See, there come down by the middle of the land and another company come along the plain of Maonium. And then says evil unto him, Where is now thy mouth? Wherewith thou says, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. It's awful tough to be called on your promises, isn't it? Right. It's awful tough when somebody says, hey, where's now thy mouth? Remember when you ran your mouth the other night about a Abimelech and how big you were and what you were going to do and how you were going to take care of business? There he is right there. <laughs> and Gaal was faced that day with, he made some pretty, pretty intense promises, pretty tough commitments. <coughs> There's going to be a time... And all these promises and all these commitments and all of these promises of faithfulness that we've made, we're going to have to put feet on and come through with them. Amen. There's going to have to be a time when all of these promises that we've made, all of these things that we've said in the loneliness of the night and in discouragement and in trial and in struggle, all of these promises that we have made, we've actually got to follow through on them. And we've got to come through. Good intentions, you know, they're great. As long as there's some kind of pursuit for them. As long as there's some kind of acting. See, listen, the children of Israel, maybe that's one reason they didn't get it. Because they looked and said, well, at least we started. Eventually we'll get to it. We'll finish. And they could never put it together that, look, you stopped building and everything fell apart. Right. You stopped working. You stopped doing what you knew you were supposed to do. And everything around you just crashed. Can you consider? Just think about it. Maybe they had good intentions. I think that they did. Maybe they didn't get it for this reason. Maybe they had some preconceived opinions and assumptions. I mentioned before, I've always had this grandiose idea of what revival is going to look like. And truly, I usually think that it's going to be when other people get saved and when other people get right. Very rarely has it actually come down to me sitting with the Lord and saying, I'm not right. There's got to be something about me that gets woken up from this dead state that I'm in. I have a lot of preconceived opinions about what revival is going to look like. You know, it's, it's, I think that in this area, at least for, for some of your churches here over the last couple of months, several different churches have had different meetings where we've had preachers come in. And, you know, we might be guilty of judging the success or failure of those meetings based on what we thought we would see. Based upon what we expected to happen. Maybe what we wanted to see. Look at our text in Haggai chapter 2. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it nothing or is it not in your eyes? In comparison of it is nothing. In Ezra chapter 3 and verse 12, it tells us about some of the older generation who had seen the glory of the first temple. And they see that this temple isn't as good and it's not as grand or glorious and there's this feeling of disappointment. The Lord looks at him and says, look at this here. 
Is there any left of you that saw the first house in its glory? You guys remember that, what it looks like? Look at this one here. It's nothing, isn't it? Doesn't look like anything to you. Doesn't look like anything at all. This one's not as big, not as much money invested. It's not going to be nearly as beautiful. It's just not a big deal, is it? And it's likely that many looked around and saw how things were going, and instead of looking at themselves, and then maybe instead of looking at their own uh, responsibility for, for what had happened and the way things were going, there were probably a lot of them that said, well, things just aren't the way they used to be. Mm -hmm. Look at this temple. You know, I can tell just by looking at the foundations, this thing isn't going to be nearly as big as Solomon's. What's the use? Mm -hmm. Things just aren't the way they used to be. This isn't the good old days anymore. Things just... Listen, if we're not careful, we're going to use that as a cop house. You're right. Amen. Amen. We are guilty of this as Baptists. We preach about our history, and there's no one that can claim the history that Baptist churches can. But I'm telling you, a lot of our churches have become museums to our history. You got it. And not Amen. to the Lord that's coming for us someday. Amen. Amen. Now, listen, Charles Spurgeon's not coming through that door tonight. Right. right. The apostles aren't coming through that door tonight. It's you and me. Amen. It's us. Amen. It's we that are here. It's folks here tonight that have been called for such a time as this. We are the ones that are here in this world. Okay, and listen. I, look at 1 Kings chapter 8. We'll just turn there and look at that. They're, you know, the old, I like to read them too. I like to read the old preachers. But listen, they're not here anymore. Amen. I'm here. You're here. And some of us have got to actually do some of the work, okay? Listen, those old preachers aren't going to do the work anymore. They, they're gone. They're in heaven. They're with the Lord. There's some of us now that are going to actually have to pick up the load. There's some of us that are going to have to do some of this work. In 1 Kings chapter 8. And in verse number 10, it says this. 1 Kings 8 and verse 10. It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. You want to know why Solomon's temple was glorious? That's it right there. It didn't have anything to do with what it was made out of. It didn't have anything to do with the timbers that were overlaid with gold. It didn't have to do with all of the pictures and all of the instruments. It didn't have anything to do with that. It had to do with who was filling that house. It had to do with the presence of God. And listen, if, if you're... If you're waiting for John Gill, I get it. I'm a poor substitute. But listen, that temple, Solomon's temple, wasn't glorious because of Solomon. It was glorious because of the Lord. This church Amen. here tonight Amen. isn't going to be glorious because of Brother Lafferty or because of a visiting preacher. It's going to be glorious if Christ Amen. fills this house when the Holy Spirit is pleased. Not just to be present. We know that when we gather together, He's present. We know that. That's a promise. But we've been content so long. To live, well, the Lord said when we meet in his name, he'd be there. We're content almost with that for him just to be here, but not actually doing anything. Right. I want to see the Holy Spirit active. Amen. I want to see something Amen. happen. I want to see lives changed, folks Amen. committed, folks that are getting involved in the work of the Lord here. Listen, no, man, things aren't the way that they used to be. You weren't even around then anyway. Right. What, are you, what are we worried about? What are we thinking about? The only thing I know about Spurgeon are things that I've read in books. I never met the guy. I don't know what happened. Thankful for the things that he wrote. Learned a lot from him. His vocabulary is beyond mine. Right. Um, but he's not coming in here tonight. Right. Amen. I'm here in 2018, and you're here. And we've got to get over this cop-out that we've used that when we look at things, and maybe we didn't see the results that we wanted, or we didn't get the evidence that we liked, well... This just ain't going to be like it was in the old days. Are you content then to never see revival? Are you content then to never see God working and God moving? Why was Thomas Temple glorious anyway? You know, the same glory that filled Solomon's house is the same one that filled that old tent in the desert. Covered in goat skins. Amen. That's right. We know it's not about those things. Ezra chapter 3. I think they didn't get it. Maybe because they had a different expectation. I assume they had good intentions. 
But I think here's the key. I think this is one of the reasons they didn't get it and we don't get it. I think they didn't see what was going on because ultimately they were still doing things. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 3, it says, They set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written. They offered the burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and every one of the willing to offer a free will offering unto the Lord. You know, they built this altar, and they had these sacrifices, and there were feasts. Now, of a truth, they had neglected the house of God. They had neglected to get back to finishing the work and building God's house. But if you look around, things are still happening. They got sacrifices, they got an altar, they got these feasts. And you're going to find, and what I found in looking at my life, is that I'm doing things all the while knowing that there's something in here that ain't right. Knowing that in me, there's something in my heart that's not in it, and that's not right. It didn't keep me from doing the things. I think we need to emphasize heavily, especially the young Christians that come to know the Lord, the importance of what it means to walk with the Lord and have a daily relationship. Amen. Amen. Because we have all struggled with this. Coming to grips with the reality that we're as far away from the Lord as we have ever been. But never miss a church service. Right. Never miss a tithe, never miss a night of revival meeting, never miss a prayer over a meal, never miss a song. I'm still doing the things. I'm still doing all of the things that I've ever done, and I'm nowhere near where I am. And, I'm not, and listen, it's a poor excuse for not having a relationship with the Lord. Amen. I'm still doing things. How can things be that bad? We got this altar. We got these sacrifices. We've got this feast. Come on, consider. Look around. Look around, you guys. That's what the prophets come and he's telling. Look, ever since you ever since you started down this path, look, look what it is. You can't even earn money, but you put it in a bag with holes. You go to draw and there's half there that you expected. You eat and you're not filled. You drink and it's never enough. Come on, think about it. Well, we, we still got this sacrifice. We still got this altar. Come on, you know that that is no replacement for actually having the Lord amongst you. For actually having a house and a place where God's presence can literally dwell. What you're doing is a poor excuse and a poor supplement to having that. They had no real tangible presence of the Lord. There was no house where the Lord could fill his glory. They were content though because they were doing things. Because they could look at themselves and feel maybe at the end of the day that they were productive. I've been as far away from the Lord as could be. And I'm telling you, we don't miss church. If one of them kids back there ain't sick, we're going to be there. Far away from the Lord as we've ever been. Never miss an offering. Special services were there. I'm nowhere near right. I'm nowhere near where I ought to be with God. And I see that I don't, you know, I don't get it. Because I'm, I'm just I'm doing the things. I'm busy. Exodus chapter 33. We all know what happened in chapter 32. Aaron made a bonehead mistake. Built this golden calf. And the Lord was about done with him. Until Moses intervened. And at the tail end of chapter 32, God says this in verse 34. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And then chapter 33, you get to verse 12, and it said, Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not yet let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. 
Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not of hence. And this right here is why we won't have revival. Amen. It's because we're satisfied and we're content to not have the presence of the Lord. You're right. Moses, when he is told, get these people and go up to the land, the angel of the Lord is going to lead you there. And you know what? For 99% of the people, that was fine. For everybody else, for, for probably for us here tonight, that's fine. We're going to heaven. We're going to be safe and sound one day. All is well. We're eternally secure. Hallelujah, by and by. Everything's going to work out fine. And Moses comes in the next chapter, and you know, he says, Lord, you didn't say who you would send with us. You said who you'd send before us, but you didn't say you'd go with us. Right. Moses made a key determination in the language the Lord had used. Lord, aren't you going to go with us? Moses was not content to go unless God went with them. Amen. Amen. That's the difference. We're content to have the status quo. Mm -hmm. We won't have revival until we realize there is no substitute for God's presence. Not an angel of the Lord going before, not an angel of the Lord going behind. Listen, it's one thing to follow a pillar of cloud by day, but Moses said, if you're not with me, we ain't going. I'm not leading this people until you tell me that you are with us. And until men and women of God stand up and say that I will not be content with my life unless there is a real presence of God, unless I have a real relationship with God, that I don't want to do that. I don't want to live this thing on my own. Not be content to just walk through this world. Sure, we're going to heaven, but listen, are you content with that? Are you content for just the eternal ages by and by? When we have people in this world, where we have family that we'd like to see the Lord do something with, Amen. where we'd like to get involved in the Lord's work and be a missionary to tell folks the gospel and see souls saved, there's so much to do. There's such a great work to do. And so, sometimes we're just kind of hanging out and we're looking and, hey, we're all going to get there someday, so it's going to work out just fine. Yeah, we've got our troubles and we've got our problems and, you know, we've got our struggles and this month it's my church, next month it'll probably be yours and this month it's my family, next month it's yours. Moses says, if you're not with me, I'm not going. <coughs> we have to cultivate that attitude. We have got to stop being satisfied with the way that things are. Amen. Just because we know all the answers to the questions. Israel knew all the answers. You ask the priest, does it work this way? No, it don't work that way. Well, what about this way? Yes, that's the way that it works. And you can outline everything that you believe. And you can put it on paper. And you can build a doctrinal statement. And you can be as sound as you want to be. But if you're living out there and you have no real presence of Christ in your life, what have you got? Amen. you got ink on paper. Mm. What, what, are we content? Are we satisfied to not have Christ's presence in our lives? There is no substitute for walking with Christ. There's no substitute Amen. for a real relationship with God every single day. And Moses could look at the Lord and say, you stopped short of telling us you would go with us. And Moses would look at the Lord and say, Lord, it's not enough. you got to be with me. You have got to go with us or I don't want to go. I have long been content to be Baptist and to know my doctrine and to go home with no power. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth. I've been content with that. Because I feel that it's enough. Just being honest, we feel this way. We feel that it's enough that we know the answers. You're right. Amen. If there's a question, we know the scripture verse to go to. And we know why we don't believe this. And we know why we believe that. We're just like those priests that could look at a situation and say, yep, that's right. No, that's not right. And yet not have any discernment that God's not with them. And live without power and live without the real presence of God. We've got to stop being content with the way things are. We won't have revival until we realize there is no substitute for having the Lord in our lives.
There's no deed you can do. There's nothing. There's no time clock you can punch. There's no slot you can fill that's a replacement for the power of God and the work of the Lord. Number three, questions applied. So at the end of the day, Haggai's message was simple. He said, consider. Consider. Tonight I could go through a whole list of questions and most of us would be able to answer those questions. If you want revival, you're going to have to have something more than answers. You're going to have to have something more than the answers to questions. You're going to have to have the real power and presence of the Lord. What does revival look like? I don't know. I don't know probably because I've never seen it. I think I know what it would look like. At least what I expect it to look like. I had all of these great pictures of what revival would be where, where men and women come and, and make things right with God and, and souls are saved and, and people are getting right, not just with God, but with each other. And I had all these great I had all these great pictures of what, what it's going to look like when revival comes. But what if, it, what if revival looks like a man walking with a limp for the rest of his life? Mm-hmm. You know, Jacob, as he wrestled with the Lord, right. and he wrestled till the breaking of the day, he grabbed a hold of God and said, I'm not letting you go. And then the Lord touched the hollow in his thigh, and Jacob got to walk with a limp for the rest of his life. You'd say, look at, that, look at that feeble old man out there with that cane. And there was a guy that's been with God mm-hmm. and wrestled with the Lord. And had his name changed by God. Maybe it looks like Aaron. Who though foolishly in Exodus chapter 32. Assisted and actually led in making this stupid golden idol. Yet as he gets right with God. Is not content to see the judgment of the Lord fall. And he actually goes and gets his censer. And he runs between God and his people. And he actually intercedes for them and intervenes. And the Bible says that he stands between the living and the dead. Someone who's not content to let God's judgment fall, but what he doesn't first stand in the way. Maybe it's someone like King Josiah who during his reign, how they find uh, how they find God's law. They find the book of the law that's been lost for years. And all of these things that were so important that had been lost for years now can be restored and read and studied again. I don't know what revival looks like. I don't know what it's going to look like in me and what it's going to look like in you, but I know this. I, all of these things that I've pictured and all of these things that I've thought, it always seems like it starts with somebody else and what they're going to do. And I've, I have been content to live a life myself without God's presence and without God's power. And that's a confession that I have to make, that I have been content to know how to answer your questions and debate things with you and, and show you what is right and be satisfied to stop there. There's, we got to have something more. Amen. Amen. We have got to have something more. If you're here tonight, I, I hope that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're like me, you've been settling for a long time. And let's just face it, we've been content because we know the truth we hold the truth we're settled and we're satisfied are we doing anything when's the last time you talked to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ when was the last time you got with a sinner and told them the gospel and tried to show someone what it means to be saved and show them to Christ when was the last time you've been with someone that you could actually be a help a blessing and encouragement to that you can get down and pray with and be an intercessor for and get between them and God and actually pray and have power with God. We're just, we're satisfied. And we're content. Until we stop being that way, we're going to struggle to see revival. We're going to struggle because if we're content not to have it, we're content with the way things are. Revival costs. It's going to cost us something. And I'm afraid that many times in life, I've not been willing to pay. i got to get better. i just got to get better. Can we pray tonight? Father, we come tonight and ask that you would forgive us of our sins and for our poor excuse 
of what we've called your service. I feel like I've wasted so much time. And I have been content as a preacher to, to just live the status quo, to, to go and preach, and read and study, and all those all of those things, but content to never pursue Christ and not stop till I reached him. Content to, to go and to live in this world without your presence with me. And if we're honest, Lord, there's probably many of us here tonight that would say that. I pray you would help us and forgive us. I don't know what revival means. I think because I've always looked forward to other people. And I'm sorry. I pray you forgive me. And help me, Lord, to, to, to look to you, to pursue you, and to not be satisfied with anything less than a relationship with you each day. And, and serving you and faithfully looking to you. Help us, Lord. Help this church. I'm so thankful for New Testament Baptist Church and for the invitation to come this week. And I pray these messages not only are a challenge, but a blessing to them, uh, a blessing as they go forward and seek you and pursue you. And I pray that in the days ahead, we'll see real revival as we consider who we are and what we are, what we need, and where we stand before you. Lord, help us each just to look in our own heart and see what it is that we need before you tonight. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.